Got a job as a business analyst at Dun & Bradstreet and I absolutely hated it. And I didn't grow up in Chicago so I really didn't know anything about the exchanges. And the first time somebody told me about them, I was like, that's what I want to do. So a couple friends of mine got hired by the uh, CBOE. So I got a job at the CBOE and I thought that might lead to trading. The Gail Flagler who hired me, was a wonderful woman, worked for the CBOE for years. She said, no, that's not the case. And then I got a job as a runner for A.G. Becker. A buddy who was at the CBO at that time would remember that firm because they had really ugly plaid jackets that everybody could spot a mile away. Eventually got the backing of Steve Fawcett, the guy who traveled around the world with Richard Branson in a balloon. And I was on a three-year contract with him and then I was able to, after that, be on my own. It was almost like a, you know, the Wild West when it started because if you had a pulse, you could get hired. Mainly just leased, so it was just paid monthly. I mean, I probably could have paid for four different seats over the time that I leased. The philosophy kind of on the SIBO in particular was since you needed more money in your account and it would fluctuate throughout the year as a market maker, you're taking on inventory and it wasn't always an upward climb. Sometimes you dip below, so you, the people who did buy seats frequently were dumping the seats at the wrong time. You liked it when the seat leases were high, because that meant you, the opportunity was there. I think uh, 2002, I had a seat lease at 12,500. Within 12 months, it was knocked down to 900. And I loved the 12, paying the 12,500 a lot more than I loved paying the 900. I did actually got uh, several people jobs as runners at AG Becker. I think they paid a $250 finder's fee, which at the time was like gold. So I. Uh, Got to, did that, and then it was you. As soon as you got the 250, you'd give 125 back to the person you got there. So it was. So that was the way it was, and they had long careers in it. So it was. Uh, like I said at the time, it was a land of opportunity. Just all the characters that were on the floor. I mean, it'd be you'd be cracking up every day because I don't know if it's because there's kind of a low-level stress all the time, even when it wasn't busy, that you're welcome for that. But I think it's also just the kind of people that were in it back then were just characters for the most part, or a, a good percentage of them were. And as it got more mature, the exchange got, you know, like NBA, Ivy League NBA people like that, which some of them were funny guys too, but the original people were, were hilarious. Well, the one thing I saw was a guy um, who had been banned from the Amex, and then he was just a real scumbag. And a friend of mine who was a broker was trying to fill an order and he was pulling some really bad stuff. So he just turned around, cold cocked him, broke his nose. <laughs> and he, uh, everybody's turning, he's saying, did anybody see that, anybody see that? And nobody saw it really. I think it was just kind of like, uh, did that happen or didn't it happen? So he didn't last long on the floor, the guy who got punched, so because he was back to his old tricks of pulling stunts that, you know, he never should have been on the floor in the first place. There's some other X-rated ones where they would hire strippers up on the floor at Christmas time they, with the mink coat and then all of a sudden pull the mink coat off. And some other ones, Susan Anton came on the floor and with Lee Keller, a guy who was probably about a foot shorter than Susan and, you know, bald with thick glasses, he was a hilarious guy. He's you know, he's got his arm around her, taking her around, and everybody's just hooting and hollering. And, you know, it was a fun thing. She was laughing at it, of course. You know, it's just towards the end when it just started to dry up. That's the worst memories. But otherwise, you'd lose money at times, but that you just kind of realize that's a part of it. You know, making money and losing money is part of it. You're not going to make money all the time when you're in a probability business. So sometimes that would go on for longer than you'd like, but then always there you know, when it's seen down, you get a little winning streak and 
it d doesn't take much for a trader to get its confidence back. It's a little bit of success. The best day in terms of money made was the 87 crash, and it was, uh, it's funny, I had a huge inventory. It was long a ton of premium, and I realized I'm really screwed if nothing happens and I can't get out of this stuff. And uh, the crash happened, and it, you know, I had out of the money puts like $30, $40 out of synthetic puts that I had in my inventory that I had forgotten about that were coming to life, you know. And I had a friend of mine who couldn't get into town. He was in a, out in Colorado, he couldn't fly in. So he made way more money than all of us because we kept bring, taking in our profits for that Monday. And he was there Tuesday taking in his profits and he probably made four times what the rest of us made, but that was still, still great for us. But I was like, damn it all, why couldn't I have you know, been unconscious for that Monday? But you can never you know, pick, pick the bottom, obviously. It was close to $2 million, so. Yeah, it was definitely the most single day that I ever made, but it was also the biggest movement ever. Yeah. I read the book by Gary Gaston, I think his name was, and then Lawrence McMillan's book, and then as a phone clerk, too, there was a guy, a uh, couple different guys, market makers, I mean, Dr. Ken Brown, he was a math professor at DePaul and also down there, so he had the most complex spreads there was when I was there and I was fortunately assigned to him and I was able to ask him a ton of questions and I also did a lot of work for him free but it was actually great education so a lot of volatility because you read a books and all that but the volatility stuff is hard to grasp unless you're really getting the schooling from somebody who's experienced who's done it you know and then even then you don't 100 percent know it until you're trading the volatility and you lose money. The first time you lose money, then your brain really kicks in to it. But yeah, that, that's how I learn. Plus, just learning from everybody around. Like, if you're a runner for two weeks, you're teaching somebody that just got hired. You know, and it's just a great learning environment. The simplest backspread would be like buying puts and calls at the money, or you're just have a ton of short stock, but more calls than not, or excessive, you know, out of the money puts. You know, the tail risk, which if that blew up, you'd really be in the driver's seat. Then you could sell some puts against it. We're trading at much higher implied volatility. So it was, uh, that's it as opposed. So like I said, you're probably making money three months out of the year. The front spreaders that are always selling the premium, they're probably making money all the time, but then they have the risk of those one or two months that, you know, you lose a ton of money. But it's, you could have one person back spread, the other one's, front spread standing right next to each other and they're both making money. So it all comes down to how do you manage your position. It's really, it's funny that it has a bigger than, you know, than your sexual orientation, your religious identity, your ethnic identity, your political affiliation, whether you're a back spreader or a front spreader was a stronger identity almost. So when you saw somebody who's a front spreader, spreader losing money, you think, boy, are they stupid. And then when they saw the back spreaders losing money, they're thinking, boy, they're really stupid. So, you know, it's just different philosophy. It really didn't change all that much. You know, it's still pretty much, you know, as a back spreader phone clerk. And there were these uh, five guys, one of them was the chairman of the board of the CBO, and they would just be selling everything. And in the late 70s and early 80s, that was a thing to do. You know, because the premiums were too high and the movement wasn't that great. So if you just sell premium, you know, they'd be down at the sign of the trader, which is now series, and they just have people bring stuff down to them. But as the market started moving, like 82, the big rally, and then dips from the rally and all that, they would be selling, you know, small premium options. They'd be buying those back and then selling puts, and then they would go back down again, they'd be buying. So they'd be selling 10 cent options and buying them back for five bucks. And I'm saying like, this is something that I will never do. You know, and so that kind of just shaped my philosophy more than anything. I was a runner for Becker and I got to be a crowd clerk in the biggest stock on the floor. And the broker hands me the deck with five minutes left to the open, to the close, and go, what do you want me to do with this? I don't have a badge, I can't fill these orders. And then he said, you gotta take it right now. 
I thought, this is strange. And all of a sudden, the whole floor was locked down. It was the FBI in there arresting people, including the broker who gave me the deck. So uh, I think the headline in the Tribune was um, bust at the cocaine corral or whatever it was. So, But anyway, it was a guy running an uh, ambitious uh, state's attorney who, or U.S. attorney, I think he was. So it was everybody was acquitted, so I don't know how, how they, they certainly weren't big drug dealers, but it was a dramatic flourish for him. He got his name in the paper. He had a jelly roll, which is you're rolling a reverse, reversal or a conversion forward. And I got it mixed up as to what it was, and it was a pretty big error, I mean like $15,000 or something like that. You know, generally if you had a position that's had some risk in it, you're just very tense beforehand. You go up to the bathroom before then, and. You, know, you needed to wear a gas mask almost because everybody was very tensed up. And so when you got down on the floor, once it once it got going and started trading, then it's fine. It was you're right though, right before the opening, it's just an uneasiness. I mean, you're always stuck with stuff you didn't want because you're making markets and you do. You're almost like a bookie, like you, how do I've got this? How do I lay this off? That would probably be every day you'd be stuck with something that wasn't ideal. Everybody just talked about sports and ranking all the girls on the floor from 1 to 20 or something and, uh, you know, just goofing off for the most part. So, it, and that was probably half the time, at least. You were kind of like a fireman, though. Like, you weren't doing anything, but at any moment something could happen. So you weren't totally divorced from what was going on. You, you still had that in the back of your head what's going on. There was definitely a tension, but I thought it was a great thing at the SIBO when it was the floor brokers couldn't trade in their own account. That was a good thing, but then it was there was a tension that, okay, they have what you need to make money. You had to get along with them, even though there were a lot of times when you didn't for various reasons. Maybe you just didn't like each other for one thing, but you had to learn how to get along. The guys who were really nice guys ever that I met were the nice floor brokers, because the ones who didn't dangle it over your head that they've got something you need that I thought were really ter terrific people. The only locals you would work were the people that were first starting out and they just didn't know what they were doing. So you kind of had to educate them. Different ways of doing it, like the good cop, bad cop routine, all that type of stuff. But you know, I, I know when I first started out, you know, you'd buy a 10 lot and you'd be panicking, you were waiting to sell the 10 lot. And it's, you know, two years later, you see somebody doing the same thing. And it's just like, you know, that's the way it is. When you first start out, nobody starts out as a courageous, guy. Well, sometimes there's accidental illegal trades. Like I've, I would have like have 5,000 stock offered and then all of a sudden um, I sold a bunch of puts so I needed to buy stock. I would buy my own stock, which that's illegal, but I had forgotten the 5,000 when I'm buying 10,000 for the puts, you know, so. Um, and everybody did things like that. People always think, well, you must have inside information. The traders on the floor were the last people to have inside information. They were the victims of it more than that. In fact, there was one time Viacom, we, they came in and there was somebody just buying calls like crazy and we're the market makers and we got to sell them. And against that, we had to buy stock. So the SEC came after us like, well, you guys bought this stock the day before it jumped up. You know, they were going to get us for insider trading. And we explained it to them, and then it was like they actually pursued the guy who was buying the calls, and we actually were remunerated for what our risk that we, you know, shouldn't have had to take. I think people are very kind to those who are struggling, and you'd see that repeatedly. You know, whether it's a trader who's making a lot of money to some clerk who doesn't have enough money for a certain situations, some helping them out, or you know, just morally supporting people who are struggling, you know, maybe emotionally or financially. You saw that all the time. But things don't last forever, for one thing. That's probably the biggest one. Because <laughs> when they turned the spigot off, it wasn't a gradual one. It was pretty immediate. So, you know, if you do things the right way and you build up a reputation, it definitely helps, you know. And that just the harder you work, the better off you are. So that then you pretty much find the traders were just hardworking people. They, you know, the image is, well, they're just crazy gamblers and everything like that. It's 
couldn't be further from the truth. They're always looking to hedge the risk, and they're always very hardworking and very, very disciplined. Very aggressive, but disciplined. And some people think those are opposite characteristics. They really, you have to have them working in tandem if you're going to be successful. This guy, Carlton McGee, he would sit next to me up at Fawcett, and he was actually a front spreader. I was a back spreader. But by explaining to me a lot of the Greeks and how they worked, it didn't matter that he was a front spreader and I was a back spreader. We were just like different sides of the same coin. So as, as I'm looking at my position everywhere, he really taught me and helped me a lot like that. Alex Hergen was a market maker, and I really learned a lot from him. And he was not thinking, well, he's a new guy, I don't want to teach him. He wanted to teach me to help bring, take on some of the volume. But I really learned a lot to him how to hedge when to step on the gas, when to lay off the gas. When they hand that thing in our hand that we had to have, right, that uh, you'd enter your stock that way. You didn't shout out to the people behind you, okay, buy me 3,000 shares or do this. So the interesting story, there's a stock SAP, uh, and it was lunchtime and almost nobody was there, like four or five, and the broker came in, and it was a German company, so it was one of those ADR, or I think American Depository Receipt things. First experience with that, and Jeff Hirsch and I, the broker came in, uh, can we buy the, just like 30 of these here? And we're like, okay, sell you 30, and then another, could you do another 30? All right, fine. We go off, and we were off on the volatility by a ton, because we didn't know what was going on in Germany. So it was like that little thing cost us about 30000 a piece, you know, for 60 lots. So that made me think that, okay, enough of my Luddite ways, I've got to find out what's going on everywhere because electronically they'll massacre you otherwise. Paper just kind of dried up in like 2003, I think it was, I left the SIBO. Um, and there just wasn't the profit, like I said before, that one year it went from 12, $12,500 to $900. So the opportunity to make money just wasn't there anymore. So that uh, I went over to the Board of Trade then and it, for a couple of years. So that lasted a little longer than the SIBO in terms of market makers.